Living Time by Maurice Nicole. Give me Nepenthe with the lolling eyes to shut away the world, to sleep, to dream, and in this clover-scented air slip through imprisoning time and find my spirit free. Alas, not thou shalt thou escape from time, that will return again and yet again, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Did thou not know time is a debtor's prison? Whom dost thou owe? O oh, not Nepenthe. Introductory Note Plato says that to become a spectator of time is a cure for meanness of soul. We live in a narrow reality, partly conditioned by our form of perception and partly made by opinions that we have borrowed, to which our self-esteem is fastened. We fight for our opinions, not because we believe them, but because they involve the ordinary feeling of oneself. Though we are continually being hurt owing to the narrowness of the reality in which we dwell, we blame life and do not see the necessity of finding absolutely new standpoints. All ideas that have a transforming power change our sense of reality. They act like ferments. But they necessarily lead us in the direction of affirmation. To see more wholly, more comprehensively, requires affirmation an assent to the existence of new truth. If there is buried in us the sense of truth, we must admit that there is a great deal superficial to it that fights against it. It is always much easier to deny than to affirm. One reason for this is that the soul is turned towards the senses, while ideas are internally perceived as distinct from the inrush of outer things. And if there is no feeling of the separateness of one's existence, no sense of essential invisibility, and no effort made in this direction, it is unlikely that we will ever be aware of them. Plato described two gods or ruling powers, one outer and one inner. Under the power of the outer, the soul is tossed about in every direction and is like a drunkard. Turn towards the world of ideas, she begins to become sane and to remember. In the following pages, a number of quotations, notes and observations have been brought together that refer in the main to the invisible side of things. How can we begin to understand the invisible? The invisible nature of man and the corresponding invisible side of the world are here dealt with from the standpoint of dimensions, not taken mathematically, and also from the related standpoint of higher levels of consciousness. The question of a new understanding of time and of what the life means in the light of this understanding is discussed. The possibility of a change in the time sense with a changed feeling of oneself enters into this question. The meaning of eternity, about which we have really erroneous notions, comes under consideration. And finally, the idea of the recurrence of the life is reviewed. It is necessary to begin with a general approach which takes into review some of our ordinary notion of things as derived from the world that is shown to us by our senses. In this connection, some reflections about the visible and invisible side of people must be first made. Chapter 1. The Invisibility of Oneself We can all see another person's body directly. We see the lips moving, the eyes opening and shutting, the lines of the mouth and face changing, and the body expressing itself as a whole in action. The person himself is invisible. We see the outside of a person much more comprehensively than the person can himself. He does not see himself in action, and if he looks in a mirror he changes psychologically and begins to invent himself. He appears very distinct and visible, very definite and clear to eye and touch, although he is not so to himself. We are distinct and clear to him, appearing to have a very real and solid existence, but to ourselves it does not seem that we have this real and solid existence. Because we see the visible side of people plainly and they see ours plainly, we will appear much more definite to one another than we do to ourselves. If the invisible side of people were discerned as easily as the visible side, we would live in a new humanity. As we are, we live in visible humanity, a humanity of appearances. 
In consequence, an extraordinary number of misunderstandings inevitably exist. Let us consider our means of communication with one another. They are limited to muscles, mainly to the smallest. We signal by means of muscles, either in speech or gesture. To reach another person, every thought, feeling, emotion must be transmitted through muscular movements and rendered visible or audible or tangible in this way. We communicate badly, partly because we never notice how we are doing it and partly because it is an extremely difficult matter to communicate anything save the simplest observations without the danger of our signals being misinterpreted. Also, as often as not, we do not exactly know what it is we are trying to communicate. Finally, nearly everything of importance cannot be expressed. But in a general sense it is because we communicate so badly and because other people understand our signals in their way, adding their own thoughts and feelings to them, that an inexhaustible supply of misunderstandings and unhappinesses arise. This is seeing the matter from one point of view, for if our invisible side were more easily demonstrated to others, new difficulties would arise. Now all our thoughts, emotions, feelings, imaginations, reveries, dreams, fantasies are invisible. All that belongs to our scheming, planning, secrets, ambitions, all our hopes, fears, doubts, perplexities, all our affections, speculations, ponderings, vacuities, uncertainties, all our desires, longings, appetites, sensations, our likes, dislikes, aversions, attractions, loves and hates, all are themselves invisible. They constitute oneself. They may or may not portray their existence. They usually do so much more than we believe. We are both much more and much less obvious to others than we suppose. But all these inner states, moods, faults, etc., are in themselves invisible, and all that we see of them in another is through, our, through their expression in muscular movement. No one ever sees fault. No one knows what we are thinking. We imagine we know other people, and all these imaginations we have of each other form a world of fictitious people that love and hate. It is impossible for me to say that I know anybody, and it is equally impossible to say that anybody knows me. For while I see all your bodily movements and outward appearances so easily, and have a hundred thousand visual impressions of you that do not exist in your mind, and have seen you as part of the landscape, part of the house, part of the street, and have a knowledge of you that you always wish to know about, what impression you make, how you look. Yes, I cannot see into you and do not know what you are and can never know. And while I have this direct access to your visible side, to all your life as seen, you have direct access to your invisibility, and to your invisibility only you have this direct access if you learn to use it. I and everyone else can see and hear you. The whole world might see and hear you, but only you know yourself. We are thus like two systems of levers, one working with all the advantage in one direction, the other with all the advantage in the other direction. Now, to the reader, all this may appear obvious, but I must assure him that it is not at all obvious. It is an extremely difficult thing to grasp, and I will endeavour to explain why this is so. We do not grasp that we are invisible. We do not realise that we live in a world of invisible people. We do not understand that life, because all other definitions of it, is a drama of the visible and invisible. The reason why we do not grasp it is because it is an idea. In this book, which is about one or two ideas, I mean by the term something which has the power of altering our standpoint and changing our sense of things. An idea is, of course, invisible, and we may never have any ideas in the sense that I mean throughout our entire existence. We think that only the visible world has reality and structure and do not conceive the possibility that the psychological world or inner world that we know as our thought, feeling and imagination may have also a real structure and exist in its own space, although not that space that we are in touch with through our sense organs. Into this inner space may come ideas. They may visit the mind. 
What we see through the power of an idea cannot be seen when we are no longer in contact with it. We know the experience of suddenly seeing the truth of something for the first time. At such moments we are altered, and if they persisted we would be permanently altered. But they come as flashes with traces of direct knowledge, direct cognition. The description of an idea is quite different from the direct cognition of it. The one takes time, the other is instantaneous. The description of the idea that we are invisible is quite different from the realisation of it. Only in thinking in different ways about this invisibility of everybody in ourselves we may attract the idea so that it illuminates us directly. Such ideas act directly on the substance of our lives as by a chemical combination. And the shock of contact may be sometimes so great as actually to change a man's life and not merely alter his understanding for the moment. The preparation of ourselves for the possibilities of new meaning, which is more desirable than anything else, since meaninglessness is a disease, cannot be separated from contact with ideas that have transforming power. We can think of an idea, in this sense, as something that puts us in contact with another degree of understanding and takes us out of inner routine and the habitual state of indolence of our consciousness, our usual reality. We cannot understand differently without ideas. It is easy enough to say in words that we are invisible, but just as we sometimes catch the meaning, for the first time of a common phrase that we have often used, we may catch the meaning of our invisibility, suddenly if we repeat often enough the sentence, I am invisible. The realisation of one's own separate existence begins at this point. It is not a natural idea because it is not derived from sensory experience or perceptible fact. While we know it in one sense already, it is not distinct. We know a great deal, only not distinctly, not authoritatively, through the inner perception of its truth. This half-discerned knowledge at the back of us cannot, I believe, be brought into focus save through the power of ideas. For ordinarily, what influences above everything is the outer, sense-given, visible world of appearances. This great sensory world with its noise, colour and movement rushing in through the open channels of sight and hearing, overwhelms the faint understanding. If I realise my own invisibility and reach for a moment a new sense of my own existence, I am the next moment lost in the effects of outer things. I am aware only of the noises in the streets and I cannot reach the experience again. I return again to my natural mind to which everything perceptible appears and for which the evidence of the senses is mainly the criterion of truth. Having experienced something inner, I find myself back in the outer, and the truth that was demonstrated to me directly as in internal truth, I can no longer demonstrate to myself with my natural reason, save as a theory or conception. Now I would say that all ideas that have the power of altering us and letting new meaning into our lives are about the invisible side of things and cannot be demonstrated directly or reached by reasoning alone. Because they relate to the invisible side of things, they are not approached by reasoning according to the evidence of the senses. Before coming to the idea of time, with which this book is chiefly concerned and which can only be understood by getting away from appearances and by thinking about the invisible world from the standpoint of dimensions, we must make some effort to grasp the invisibility of ourselves. For I believe that we never understand anything about the invisible world if we do not grasp our own invisibility first. This demands a certain kind of effort, the nature of which is similar to the effort required to get some realisation of the essential invisibility and unknowableness of another person. In this connection, I believe that we can never realise the existence of another person in any real way unless we realise our own existence. The realisation of one's own existence as a real experience is the realisation of one's essential invisibility. Our usual sense of existence is derived from external things, 
we try to press into the visible world, to feel ourselves in something outside us, in money, possessions, clothes, position, to get out of ourselves. We feel that what we lack lies outside us, in the world that our organs of sense delineate to us. This is natural because the world of sense is obvious. We think, as it were, in terms of it and towards it. The solution of our difficulties seems to lie in it, in getting something, in being honoured. Moreover, we do not support even a hint of our invisibility easily and do not reflect that while we are related to one obvious world on one side through the senses, we may be related to another world on another side, not at all obvious, through understanding to a world which is just as complex and diverse as the world given by sense and which has just as many desirable and undesirable places in it. Our bodies stand in the visible world. They stand in the space of three dimensions, accessible to the sense of sight and of touch. Our bodies are themselves three-dimensional. They have length, height and breadth. They are solids in space. But we ourselves are not in this world of three dimensions. Our thoughts, for instance, are not three-dimensional solids. One thought is not to the right or left of another thought. Yet are they not quite real to us? If we say that reality is confined to that which exists in the three-dimensional world outside, we must regard all our thoughts and feelings inside as unreal. Our inner life oneself, has no position in that space which is perceptible to the senses. But while thought, feeling and imagination have no position in space, it is possible to think of them having position in some other kind of space. One thought follows another in passing time. A feeling lasts a certain time and then disappears. If we think of time as a fourth dimension or a highest dimension of space, our inner life seems to be related to this higher space or world in more dimensions than those accessible to our senses. If we conceive of a higher dimensional world, we might consider that we do not live, properly speaking, in the world of three dimensions that we touch and see and in which we meet people, but have more intimate contact with a more dimensioned form of existence, beginning with time. But before coming to the subject of dimensions, let us first consider the world of appearances, i.e. the world which our senses reveal to us, and make some reflections on two ways of thinking, one of which starts from the visible side of things and the other from the invisible. All that we see falls on the retina of the eye, upside down, as in a camera. A picture of the world refracted through the lens of the eye falls on the surface of the retina where it is received by a great number of nerve endings or sensitive points. The picture is two-dimensional, like that on a screen, upside down and distributed over separate recording points. Yet this picture is in some way transformed for us into the smooth, solid world we behold. And now a quote from W.K. Clifford, Lectures and Essays, Volume 1, page 260. 1879, from Lecture Philosophy of the Pure Sciences. Out of pictures I have imagined solid things. Out of space of two dimensions, as we call it, I have made space of three dimensions. End quote. Now the outer world seems close to us, not as if we were in contact with it, but as if we were in it. We are not aware of being in contact with it only through our sense organs, situated all over the curtain of flesh. We do not have the impression of looking into the world through the little living nerve machines of the eye. The world merely seems there, and we right in the middle of it. Nor does it seem to be a quantity of separate impressions coming through our various senses that combine by the action of the mind into a composite whole. Yet we know that if we had no eyes or ears, we could not see or hear anything. Simultaneous sensations coming through the different senses and combined in the mind give us the appearance and qualities of a rose. The rose is actually created for us out of all these separate impressions. 
yet it is practically impossible to realise the matter in this way. For us, the rose is simply there. When we consider that the picture of the world on the retina is two-dimensional and that this is the source of contact with the outer scene, it is not difficult to understand that Kant came to the conclusion that the mind creates the physical world and lays down the laws of nature owing to innate dispositions in it that arrange the stream of incoming sensations into an organised system. The senses merely give us messages and out of these we create the visible, tangible, audible world by some inner action of the mind, by something which is more than the messages. But it is extremely difficult to persuade ourselves that this is so because in order to do so we must detach ourselves from the overwhelmingly immediate impression of an external reality in which we are invariably immersed. Now this effort is of the same peculiar nature as that required to bring to us a realisation of the invisibility of ourselves or other people. We are immersed in appearances. This is one of the meanings in the idea of Maya, in Indian philosophical thought. We are not separate from the outside because we take it for granted. We are mingled with it through sense and our thinking is moulded on it, that is, on our senses. Two ideas appear here, one, that we follow what the senses show us of the world in our forms of thought, two, that we take the external as real in itself and not as a matter connected with the nature of our senses. What do we mean by appearances? Let us include in this term all that the senses show us. They show us a person's body, the outward appearance of him. They do not show his consciousness spirit or soul, or his history, his life, all that he has fought, done, loved and hated. They show us practically nothing about him, yet we fasten on the apparent side of him as the chief thing. They show neither the invisible side of a person nor the invisible side of the world, yet what we think of as real and existing, we always confound with what the senses reveal. Let us consider the composite picture of the world that is built up for us internally, according to some older thinkers, by the action of the imagination. What we see comes to us through the medium of light, transmitted through the ether, and what we hear through the medium of sound transmitted through the air. Touch is by direct contact. Each of the senses works in a remarkably separate manner fashioned for its own medium and responding only to its particular set of stimulations. Yet all these messages from such different sources are united together into unitary meaning. We see a person, hear him, touch him and do not get the impression of three persons, but one person, and this is really extraordinary. Now, there are many reasons for saying that our senses respond to only a very limited part of the external world, take the eyes, they respond to vibrations of light which travel at 186,000 miles a second in the ether, but what we call light is merely one octave of vibrations out of at least 50 other known octaves of vibration that travel in the ether at the same speed and reach us from sun and stars and perhaps galaxies. So that it is only this one single octave out of all these that our eyes are open to. Seen as a unity or whole, light appears white, but split up into separate notes it appears as colours. The violet side of a rainbow is the seat of vibrations of about twice the frequency of those on the red side, so roughly speaking there is an octave in between. But beyond the violet there are three ascending octaves of ultraviolet light, i.e. of increasing frequency. Behind that, seven octaves of what are known as X-rays, beyond that still higher octaves of higher frequencies and shorter and shorter wavelengths, so much so that they can pass through a great thickness of lead with ease. Below the red end of the rainbow are descending octaves of lower frequency, infrared rays, wireless waves, etc. But the eye sees only one octave out of all these. Our picture of the external world, which we take as our criterion of the real, is relative to the forms of our external senses. It does not necessarily exist, indeed it cannot, for itself as we see it, whatever it really is, 
we see it merely in a certain way. Its appearance is conditioned by our organs of perception. There is a vast, invisible side that we can never enter into as direct sensory experience as we enter into the experience of light. Light enters into our consciousness directly, but X-rays or wireless vibrations do not. There may be insects or plants which are conscious in one or other form of radiant energy apart from light, and so live in a world different from our world. It is even possible that our brains may be receptive organs, apart from that side open to the sensory influx from skin, eyes, nose, ears, etc. The extensive aberrations of nerve cells at the surface of the cortex might suggest vast receptive arrangements like the branching of trees towards the sun, but we have no evidence for this. But, considering the great ladder of vibrations which is the universe in terms of energies, we cannot say that our senses reveal the totality of things. Our eyes clearly answer to only a limited range of vibrations in the ether. The universe may be conceived as a polygon of a thousand or a hundred thousand sides or facets, and each of these sides or facets may be conceived as representing one special mode of existence. Now, of these thousand sides or modes, all may be equally essential, but three or four only may be turned towards us or be analogous to our organs. One side or facet of the universe, as holding a relation to the organ of sight, is the mode of luminous or visible existence. Another, as proportional to the organ of hearing, is the mode of sonorous or audible existence. And that's from Sir William Hamilton Lectures in Metaphysics, Volume 1, page 142. This passage was written before the opening up of the world of radiant energies by scientific investigation. Whether consciousness be response to energy or energy itself, it is evident that we live in a world filled with different energies and are conscious of only a few. Since physics has resolved matter into forms of energy, we can no longer think, in a crude way, of a material universe, of mere lumps of matter. It would seem obvious, rather, that we are in a universe of energies in different scales and are given naturally a response to a fraction of them. I have mentioned that it is an extraordinary thing that stimulations come in into us through our senses from such widely separated sources in the natural scale should fall together so easily into composition. But this composition is relatively valid. If a gun is fired close at hand, we see the flash and hear the report simultaneously, and so connect one with the other. But if the gun is fired far away at sea at night, we see the vivid flash and many seconds later hear the air shaken by the report because sound travels very slowly in comparison with light. Comparatively, it crawls into the medium of the air at about one mile in four seconds, while light flashes through the ether at 180,000 miles a second. If we had had no previous experience, we might not even connect the flash and the report. At a distance, the composite picture of the world presented to us by our senses shows signs of falling apart, or rather, assuming another aspect in regard to time. And even though light messages travel so fast, when we look up at the heavens we see stars shining where, ordinarily speaking, for themselves they are not. We see them in their past, where they were thousands of years ago. Their past is present for us. Even the sun, which is close, is not where we see it in space because its light takes eight minutes to reach us, so we see it where it was eight minutes ago. We cannot, then, be certain that what we see is the unchallengeable reality of things. If our senses worked in a different way, if we had more senses or fewer, what we customarily call reality would be different. The matter has been expressed by Kant in many passages, in one of which he says that if, quote, the subjective constitution of the senses in general were removed, the whole constitution and all the relation of objects in space and time, nay, space and time themselves, would vanish, end quote. And if our senses were changed, the appearance of objects would change for, quote, as appearances they cannot exist in themselves but only in us. What objects are in themselves, apart from all the receptivity of our sensibility, remains completely unknown to us. We know nothing but our mode of perceiving them, 
a mode which is peculiar to us and not necessarily shared in by every being. End quote. What is it in us that begins to raise objections to this view of the relative reality of the visible world? We are firmly anchored to what the senses show us. Perceptible reality is the starting point of our thought. Sense thinking characterises the natural action of the mind and we refer to sense as final proof. It is not necessary to think that appearance themselves are illusions or that the senses show us an illusionary world. They show us part of reality. Is not the starting point of illusion rather the taking of appearances for all ultimate reality and the belief that sense perception is the sole standard of the real? The seen world is real but does not embrace reality. It is built out of invisible realities which surround it on every side. The visible world is contained in a much greater invisible world, invisible to us, and we do not lose one by studying the other, but enlarge one into the other. But as our natural everyday logic is so closely connected with sense thinking, it fights against this enlarging of the world, and its actual form of understanding becomes a psychological barrier to further understanding. If we could in some unknown way apprehend the totality of things apart from the senses, we would, according to many early authorities, perceive the universe as the unity that its name originally implies. So this is a quote from Sufi literature. If the senses were eliminated, the world would appear as a unity. End quote. An example of the experiencing of the universe as a vast coherence will be given later. Now the senses split up the totality of things and in following the evidence we collect an enormous quantity of little separated facts. We forget that they are all merely little bits of one gigantic system. These little facts intoxicate us easily. We do not merely think that we have discovered something but created it. We forget we start out from an already prepared and connected world which lies behind any little facts that we can discover about it. We too easily forget that we start from a given world. The little facts seem to explain things, to do away with mystery, so that in our conceit we begin to think in a certain way, seeing life as a question of innumerable little facts and human existence as something that can be regulated by facts. An immense quantity of labour is expended in collecting further facts, till it seems as if this gathering of facts were going to replace all real life and living experience. The search for facts began with the study of the outer phenomenal world, i.e. with science. It made truth seem to be only outside ourselves, in facts about matter. It sought to find the basic principle of the universe, to solve its riddle, to find it out, in something outside, in the atom, believing that the explanation of everything would thus be found and the ultimate cause of the universe and all that it contains would be laid bare. Everything was submitted to weighing and measuring, and the mathematical treatment of phenomena began. One kind of thinking became predominant, which, starting from the visible, concerns itself only with what can be termed external truth, and particularly with quantities. The older, pre-scientific thought concerned itself mainly with qualities. Now regarded only as a physical body, man is an infinitesimal quantity of matter in the universe of life. Taken as a measurable quantity in a universe of measurable quantities, he is ruled out of the picture. Conceive his material bulk in comparison with the earth. He vanishes so that thinking only quantitatively about ourselves and the universe and starting from the visible, demonstrable, weighable side of things, we think in the direction of our own annihilation as individuals. Man is composed of qualities, and these do not lend themselves to measurement or to mathematical treatment, save fictitiously. It is impossible to say of a man, let his courage equal X and his capacity for affection equal Y, and in this way represent him in mathematical symbols. With the increasing predominance of external over internal truth, all that truly belonged to man came to be looked upon as secondary and unreal, and the primary and real field for investigation was held to lie in that which existed independently of man's mind in the external world. 
The transition between the quantitative and qualitative standpoints is well expressed in the following passage. And this is taken from E. A. Burt, The Metaphysical Foundations of Modern Physical Science, London, 1925. Start quote. Till the time of Galileo, 17th century, it had always been taken for granted that man and nature were both integral parts of a larger whole, in which man's place was the more fundamental. Whatever distinctions might be made between being and non-being, between primary and secondary, man was regarded as fundamentally allied with the positive and the primary. In the philosophies of Plato and Aristotle, this is obvious enough. The remarks hold true, nonetheless, for the ancient materialists. Man's soul for Democritus was composed of the very finest and most mobile fire atoms, which statement at once allied it to the most active and causal element in the outside world. Indeed, to all important ancient and medieval thinkers, man was a genuine microcosm. In him was exemplified such a union of things primary and secondary as truly typified their relations in the vast macrocosm. Whether the real and primary be regarded as ideas or as some material substance. Now, in the course of translating this distinction of primary and secondary into terms suited to the new mathematical interpretation of nature, we have the first stage in the reading of man quite out of the real and primary realm. Obviously, man was not a subject suited to mathematical study. His performances could not be treated by the quantitative method except in the most meagre fashion. His life was a life of colours and sounds, of pleasures, of griefs, of passionate loves, of ambitions and strivings. Hence the real world must be, it was thought, the world outside of man, the world of astronomy and the world of resting and moving terrestrial objects. End quote from E. A. Burt. Since ultimate truth and reality were sought in something outside man, investigation naturally passed into the world of atoms, but the atom turned out to constitute no simple, easy, non-ethical basis for the explaining away of the universe. The atom proved to be a system of extraordinary complexity, a small universe in itself. Searching more and more into small parts and seeking always to explain the whole by its parts, science reached further mysteries. On its philosophical side, it now begins to turn towards ideas that are similar to those with which pre-scientific thought was concerned. But what we have especially to notice is that the form of thoughts which starts from the visible, from fact, tends to rule man out of the picture. People have the delusion that it puts him more strongly into the picture, partly because they do not understand that man is himself essentially invisible. All that is most real for him lies in his invisible life and, relatively, the visible is not merely so real to him, although the power of appearances make it seem so. If we start with the visible, then in order to explain it we must pass into its parts. If we seek to explain man by his organs, his organs by the cells composing them, the atoms by electrons, we lose sight of the man as a whole. Under the microscope, the man himself completely disappears. It is obvious that we can explain a chair by its parts, but this is only one way of thinking about it, one form of truth. The chair is also to be explained by the idea in the mind that conceived it. No quantitative investigation, no chemical analysis or microscopic examination can detect this idea or give us the full meaning of the chair's existence. If we ask ourselves, what is the cause of the chair, how can we answer this question? The chair exists before us as a visible object. Its cause has two sides. On the visible side, it is caused by the wooden parts of which it is made. On the invisible, it is caused by an idea in somebody's mind. There are thus three terms. Idea, chair, wood. Naturalism, or scientific materialism, lay stress on the third term. It lays stress on the separate material parts which enter into the composition of any object, seeking in them for cause. The idea behind organised matter is overlooked. That which is manifest in time and space engages its attention. 
and so it cannot help looking for causal origin in the smaller constituent parts of any organism, and also in preceding time, i.e. in the past. Now the moment of the origin of the chair in time and space can be taken as the moment when the first piece of wood is shaped for its construction. A chair is begun, visibly, with the first piece of wood, a house with the first brick. But prior to the beginning of the chair or house in time or space, the idea of either of them exists in someone's mind. The architect has already the whole conception of the house in his mind before the first brick is laid down. But in translating this idea into visible expression, the smallest part of the house must appear first in passing time. The architect thinks first of the whole idea, of the house as a whole, and from that proceeds to smaller and smaller details. But in manifestation in time, this process is reversed. The force of the idea, in order to become manifest in expression, must first pass into the smallest detail. E.g., a single brick is the first point of the manifestation of the idea of the house. The first expression in time and space of an idea is one single elementary material constituent. Yet the idea is already complete in the architect's mind, but invisibly so. When the house is finished, it expresses the idea in visible form. The house has grown up, so to speak, as something intermediate between the first term, idea, and the third term, elementary material part. When the house is completed as the second term, the first and third terms through which the construction of the house was effected drop out, the idea has found expression in time and space and the separate bricks are no longer thought of as such but become an aggregate which is the house itself. It is possible to analyse the house into the bricks and mortar which compose it and it is always possible to say that the bricks are the cause of the house. But it is inadequate because the whole structure of the house, its form and the integration of its separate parts, have their ultimate origin in the idea in the architect's mind. And this idea is not in time or space. I mean that it is not in the phenomenal or visible world. It is obvious that the first and third term, that is, idea and elementary brick, are both causal and that we must think of causality in two categories. All that scientific materialism finds as causal is correct on the phenomenal side, but ultimately insufficient. And idea by itself cannot be cause. Both the first and third terms are necessary, acting in conjunction. In a broad sense, two types of mind exist, one that argues from the first term and the other from the third term. It is a union of both standpoints that is necessary. The difficulty is that owing to the laws of time, even the fullest formed and most complete idea must necessarily express itself sequentially, in visible manifestation, in the most elementary form first of all. A long period of trial and error may be necessary before it can be properly realised in manifestation. And it will always appear, to the senses, that the first elementary material starting point of the idea, in passing into visible manifestation, is itself the cause of all that follows. It looks that way, and because it looks that way, the modern doctrine of evolution has arisen. Consider the plastic material elements of organised living matter, the world of atoms of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, sulphur and phosphorus, this marvellous paint box where valency is the mingling power, and from which arise an infinite diversity of combinations and groupings and an endless variety of products. This constitutes the third term, the material elements out of which the world and its life are built. Man has a far more limited range, a far grosser range, of plastic material that he can use directly. If his ideas could play directly and easily into the atomic world, what material transformations could he not effect? If my mind could play directly into the atomic world of this wooden table upon which I am writing, I could change it into innumerable substances without difficulty by merely rearranging the atoms which compose it. And if I had this power over the atomic world and I knew the idea of life, I could create life. But it would be mind and idea, not the material elements themselves, that would be true cause in such magic. 
I mentioned that naturalism lays stress on the third term as cause. Through its eyes, we tend to see everything as quantity and material arrangement rather than quality, meaning or idea. The emphasis is on one side, on the external, extended, sense-given side of the universe. It corresponds to an attitude that everything must know and recognise in himself. The world is as we see it, and somehow or other it is self-derived. Somehow or other the atoms comprised in it fell into certain arrangements, and visible masses of matter, as well as living creatures, somehow or other appeared. What does naturalism take away from us? It leads, of course, to a somewhat dead view of things. In its extreme forms, it takes the view that we live in a gigantic and mechanical universe, a meaningless machinery of planets and suns, in which man has accidentally appeared as a minute speck of life, negligible and ephemeral. Stressing the third time alone, this view is true enough. It means that if man is to improve his life, he must only deal with the external, visible world. There is nothing real save what man can reach through his senses. So man should invent and build new machinery and amass as many facts as possible about the visible world and set about to conquer nature. This standpoint turns man outwards. It makes him see his field of activities as only outside himself. It makes him think that by discovering some fresh facts about the material universe, he will be able to assuage his own sorrow and pain. There is today a very remarkable turning outwards of mankind, connected with scientific developments and an increasingly diffused expectancy that new discoveries and inventions will solve man's problems. The attitude of scientific materialism, which especially characterised the latter part of the 19th century, has reached the masses. It has also reached the East. Mankind now sees the solution of its difficulties lying in something outside itself. And with this attitude there inevitably goes the belief in mass organisations of peoples and a corresponding loss of the inner sense of existence, the effacement of in individual differences and a gradual obliteration of all the rich diversity of custom and local distinction which belongs to normal life. The world becomes smaller and smaller as it becomes more and more uniform. People lose the power of any separate wisdom. In place of it, they imitate each other increasingly. And it is just this that makes possible mass organisation. Hand in hand with this goes the linking up of the world by rapid transit and wireless communication so that the entire world abnormally responds to a single local stimulus. And above all this hovers the strange chimera that seems to shimmer in the imagination of all humanity today. The fantasy that science will discover some secret, some solution that will rid the earth of its brutality and injustice and restore the golden age. This idea that we can discover final solutions to the difficulties of life and that mankind as a whole can reach truth at some future date ignores the fact that every person born into the world is a new starting point. Every person must discover for himself all that has been discovered before. Every person must find truth for himself. Apart from this, what can we see today as the result of man's belief that he can organise life merely by scientific knowledge? From the practical side, we only see that man's inventions increasingly take charge of him. We see machines becoming disproportionate to human life. It is surely obvious that the development of machinery is not the development of man, and it is equally obvious that machinery is enslaving man and gradually removing from him his possibilities of normal life and normal effort and the normal use of his functions. If machinery were used on a scale proportionate to man's needs, it would be a blessing. If people could only understand that the latest discovery is not necessarily the best thing for humanity and become sceptical of the word progress, they might insist on bringing about a better balance. What we fail to grasp is that the pressure of outer life is not necessarily lessened by new discoveries. They only complicate our lives still further. We do not only live by bread but by word. 
It is not only new facts and facilities that we need, but ideas and the stimulation of new meanings. Man is his understanding, not his possession of facts or his heap of inventions and facilities. Only for his own, hard-won understanding does he find his centre in himself, whereby he can withstand the pressure of outer things. Yet it is obvious that nothing can check the general momentum of events today. There is no discernible force in Western civilization strong enough to withstand it, and the modern world has yet to learn that the standpoint of naturalism is inimical to man in the long run. To lay stress only on the third term, on the visible and tangible, seems logical enough. But man is more than a logical machine. No one can understand either himself or another person merely through the exercise of logic. We can indeed understand very little through logic, but the tinnery of this faculty can become so great that it can destroy much of the emotional and instinctive life of man. Contrasted with naturalism is the older standpoint which puts man in a created universe, part visible and part invisible, part in time and part outside time. The universe as we see it is only one aspect of total reality. Man, as a creature of sense, knows only appearances and only studies appearances. The universe is not only sensory experience, but inner experience as well, i.e. there is inner truth as well as outer truth. The universe is both visible and invisible. On the visible side, the third term, stands the world of facts. On the invisible side, the first term, stands the world of ideas. Man himself stands between the visible and invisible sides of the universe, related to one through his senses and to the other through his inner nature. At a certain point, the external, visible side of the universe leaves off, as it were, and passes into man as internal experience. In other words, man is a certain ratio between visible and invisible. Because of this, the outer scene does not complete him and no outer improvement of the conditions of life will ever really satisfy him. Man has inner necessities. His emotional life is not satisfied by outer things. His organisation is not only to be explained in terms of adaptation to outer life, he needs ideas to give meaning to his existence. There is that in him that can grow and develop some further state of himself, not lying in tomorrow, but above him. There is a kind of knowledge that can change him, a knowledge of quite a different quality from that which concerns itself with facts relating to the phenomenal world, a knowledge that changes his attitudes and understanding, that can work on him internally and bring the discordant elements of his nature into harmony. In many of the ancient philosophies, this is taken as man's chief task, his real task. Through inner growth, man finds the real solution of his difficulties. It is necessary to understand that the direction of this growth is not outwards, in business, in science or in external activities, but inwards, in the direction of knowledge of himself through which there comes a change of consciousness. As long as man is turned only outwards, as long as his beliefs turn him towards sense as the sole criterion of the real, as long as he believes only in appearances, he cannot change in himself. He cannot grow in this internal sense, through the standpoint of naturalism, he cuts himself off from all possibilities of inner change. He must relate himself to the world of ideas before he can begin to grow. That is, he must feel that there is more in the universe than is apparent to the senses. He must feel that other meanings are possible, other interpretations, for only in this way can his mind become open. There must have come to him the feeling of something else. He must have wondered what it is. He must have wondered what he is, what life can possibly mean, what his existence means. Certain kinds of questioning must have occurred in his soul. Is the meaning of existence more than it appears to be? Do I live in something greater than what my senses reveal? Are all my problems merely outer problems? Is knowledge about the external world the only possible knowledge?